Okay, this is January, January of 54. St. Louis really has the body shop humming. They're so good now that they're actually attaching the molding on the door without having to go through the rigmarole of custom fitting each one. They're starting to pump the cars out. And Zora is already working on fuel injection in January of 54. This is the first page in his personal file dated January 9th. He's annotated at the bottom. He's following the fuel injection work being done by Dolza and they're using the 53 Buick nail head engine, the newest engine in GM, as the workhorse. This is January 13th, 1954. Dr. Maurice Ali shows up at GMI with a 53 Corvette. With him is John G. Coffin, who has newly been named the Chevrolet plastic engineer for the Corvette, and he's a recent GMI grad. And on the second half of that, uh, John Camden. John Camden is second from the left, right between Maurice Ollie and the guy to the far left. John Camden became Zora Gunpot's fuel injection engineer. Still alive, still remembers everything uh, vividly. Gib Huffstetter is over the rear fender. Uh, let's see, there's, I wish I had a pointer. I'm trying to tell you where he is. He's in the middle. He's got a black tie, a light sport car. There's three guys that are up going on a horizontal uh, right from the windshield, and he's in, in that center center picture looking forward. Gib Huffstetter was part of that uh, suspension engineer in the 60s with the Penske car and the like. And Stan Mick was a junior at the time. He's in the lower picture here. He went on to work that fuel injection at Rochester. Three significant people. January 24th, they decided to purchase a 54 test Corvette. It's numbered similarly, except for the year. It's 4950, the first one. This is for Ed Cole, and they're gonna keep it in the executive garage so he can hand it out to VIPs. Zora's still testing 856. Zora's also now test driving a Porsche in the rain at the proving ground on the Belgian blocks. So Chevrolet is getting pretty serious about studying the competition and trying to improve the ride and handling of the Corvette. While he's there, he enamors himself to the people at the proving ground, obviously when he states to them that they're not doing their charts right. They're not following convention. They're making all these errors and therefore they don't draw the right conclusions and that's his quote at the bottom. So he absolutely endeared himself to the people at the proving ground. 3951, this is VIN number two. This is the work order to build it into a V8. There's a picture under the hood. The only thing that's not real in this picture is a simulated air cleaner. It's a very early V8. If you notice down here in the bottom, the, uh, uh, the water outlet is in the intake manifold yeah. on the face of it. So we have Car no VIN number two getting a V8, and we have car number seven getting a V8. This is March 26, the first real pre-production V8s are now being tested routinely. Uh, Corvettes being tested at both a two barrel and a four barrel. Mm. And the engine uh, number stamped on the pack, pad, the Corvette engine assembly was six, work order 16965-B. You run across one of those in a swap meet, buy it. Highly recommended. Some more details on the V8 testing. Then Zora writes his three page epistle on how to improve Corvette ride and handling. And don't forget, he's still using his old Warhorse 856. And what I find remarkable here is in March of 54. He's already got the complete chassis set up on 856 that will become the 1956 SR1 at Sebring. He's already got it done. He's already got the 1957 RPO 684 heavy duty chassis parts on this car. 
So you gotta ask yourself, what? Why does it take so long to get it in production? It's called roadblocks. He's got a specifically. He's got a stabilizer bar of 8.43, which is exactly what they went to on the 57 Airbox car. And he's got the two degree aluminum shaper, tapered shims in the car already. How do you like that, Meyer? <laughs> That was to get the camber because over 60 miles an hour you yeah, lost all your right. camber. Well, he knew it in 54. <laughs> okay, and you can see that he's he's actually working his way up the totem pole as far as uh, respectability because he's being copied routinely with you know likes Cole, Byer, Sanders, Rosenberger. Wolfram is still on the job, by the way. He was supposed to work himself out of a job a year earlier, and he still has it. Now they're gonna. Uh, purchase a 1954 with all the match metal dies, the one, even the, the small parts to replace the 53. So that car is going to be obsolete, car number 8. Here's more of the ride and handling. Uh, he's actually, Zora is now actually involved in setting up the V8 suspension on car number 2. So the V8's in it, and they've asked him to come in and try to set, set up the front suspension for that. Uh, he realizes that uh, they lose uh, at elevated speed, they lose the stability. That's why those shims were in there. It's a three page long report. He's also looking at, already, he's also looking at independent rear suspension for the Corvette. Nine years before his production, he's already working on it. He's working on it with Maurice Ali. And the funny thing is, he's just come back from Le Mans. A year later, after they almost fired him, this time he worked it into a business trip where they paid for it. <laughs> so things changed quite a bit. Uh, this is one of the drawings that's in that report, and the reason it's the Allen is because Zora actually designed this chassis for the uh, J2X Allard when he consulted to them before he went to work for Chevrolet. Mm. That's why he knew that like the back of his hand. And Maurice Ali was also an independent rear suspension expert. He built a 1936 Cadillac in 1936 when he worked at Cadillac with an independent rear suspension. They tested that car for four years at Cadillac successfully. So here he is writing a letter. He's literally teaching Duntoff. He's tutoring Duntoff on everything he's learned in 30 years of independent rear suspension. And he's redoing it by re-sketching these things to help Duntoff teach him how they, uh, how they evaluate such a thing. So he's been a great mentor and they both share the passion. This is his business trip on, after he came back from Le Mans. He met with Porsche and he met with a company called Man Diesel. It wasn't to get into the diesel business, it was to learn how to use aluminum pistons and chrome plate pistons and polished pistons because Man Diesel was the, the best there was at it. July 8th, Flint V8 built its very first production engine that we still have. It's at the Heritage Center. And the guy there who's on the hot test stand is pointing to a Jefferson Nickel standing on edge. That engine is actually running. It was balanced so well that you could balance a nickel on the intake manifold. And at Tonawanda, we used to do that every time a tour came through. We, every guy in the hot test would stand there and put a nickel on a running engine. Worked, worked everywhere. Shortly after his return, he went and he visited the technical center. He was hosted by John Dolza. Dolza. This is his trip report, Zora's trip report to Maurice Ali talking about Dolza, talking about the diesel, the new GM closed brake design, the progress of Buick fuel injection, the Molly piston plating, and specifically the Buick show car, the XP100. These photos were also in the GM files, but they had no idea when they were taken or what they were about, so they now know, and I've given them this information, and that was Sweden's Prince Bertel. They used to come to the US every year, tour in August when Europe was on vacation, tour the GM Tech Center, and then go home with an ex-GM styling car that he paid a lot of money for. But he, he got one every year. October 15, 1954, Zora writes a letter to Ed Cole and his direct superior, Maurice Ali. 
never been published. It's Zora clearly speaking out of tune. He's lamenting the demise of the Corvette. It's being canceled because of the Thunderbird success. Zora says, quote, by the looks of it, the Corvette is on the way out. And he clearly says it is an admission of failure, among other things. He says the Corvette failed because it did not be, meet GM's standards of a product. It did not have value for the money. With a six-cylinder engine, it was no better than a medium-priced family car. Actually, the higher price Chevy sedans could outrun the Corvette all day long at the proving ground in real-world situations when you put handling in it. He said the timing was also unfortunate. When the novelty appeal was the highest, we hadn't the cars to sell. They were taking them all over the country from January through August and didn't have a car to sell. Not a one. Not until they built the 250 until the last two months of the year. And then after we had the 250, what did our advertising say? Now everybody can have one. <laughs> no kit, no kid can't make this stuff up. Go back and look at the ads. They totally blew it. And he lobbies on the last page, he lobbies for a dedicated Corvette organization to stave off death. He says, an organization which will eat and sleep Corvette as our divisions are eating and sleeping their particular cars. It didn't fit, it was rejected by the engineers, it stayed with the outside engineering, and you just couldn't improve a car that way. It didn't mesh with the Chevrolet engineering organization. August 1955, the first of those two prototypes. I cannot tell you which one is car number two and which one is car number seven. We might be able to close in on that one of these days. Right now, I can't tell you. This is actually one of the reworked 53s to look like a 55. It's hand built, it's car 5950. And 5951, this is a page out of the actual Proving Ground uh, book that was kept in the car. The car was, this book was issued October 28, 1954. It even tells you what the license plate was. It tells you that the engine under the hood was stamped 1374F55F. That's the 374V8 built since July 9th, it's been around a while. The F does not stand for power pack, it stands for a two barrel engine. And that tells me that this engine was then rebuilt into a power pack engine to put into this car. Again, I can't tell you which one was which of the 53s. This is the actual drawing that was over, hanging over the line at Flint V8, November 4th, 1954, telling the employees on the line, one engine parts to put on each of the suffixes down the left hand side. And the Corvette was such a dismal failure that the Corvette engine is not even on the chart. They didn't even put it on the chart. November 23rd, my fourth birthday, GM rolled out its 50 millionth car, a 55 gold Bel Air with a V8 under the hood and everything on the car was gold plated. Rolled out with a big parade in Flint and Harlow Curtis the President GM presided over it. Now, to get some performance in the car in December, they're talking about putting a three-speed in it, and uh, Zora is involved initially in this three-speed. He actually writes a letter to Ollie. It's four pages long. This is a build order to build a 1954 261 cubic inch short block for use in Mr. Henry DuPont's Corvette Send an express to Mr. H.B. DuPont at the DuPont building in Wilmington, Delaware. One more sign of proof that Bill Byer wasn't BSing me. He worked on this. There it is. There's the paperwork to build it and shipped it to him. And if he got one, probably some other people got one too. This is the uh, blueprint for the 55 chassis dated December 18th, 1954. Now we're getting up to that, we're going back to the car 5951 with the power pack and the power glide. They're taking the power glide out and they're turning it into the first three speed test car. And to do that, turns out uh, it was an overdrive. 
So they're taking that out and they're changing the rear end from a 370 to a 355. And they're even considering buying four speed transmissions from either Hydromatic or Jaguar. And this is the letter come, this is a letter from Duntoff uh, telling him about his inquiries on buying Jaguar transmissions. But they're really serious, at least Laura's serious about getting a four speed in the Corvette. This is the O dash number uh, for the V8 engine. It was O dash 122013. It was renamed uh, production part number 386779 on January 18th, 55. 58 uh, block. Zora uh, proposes a close ratio three speed. Zora comes up with a 184 first, 131 second. And he explains in his letter his thinking about the geometric progression. They build it, it doesn't work very well. John Dolza, meanwhile, uh, created a U.S. patent for what was called the Economizer. It was a Chevrolet V8, okay, and he got a patent for it, and it ran as either an eight cylinder or a four cylinder. Hey, has anybody heard of that lately? <laughs> he got a GM pickup truck the last 10 years? <laughs> what took so long? That stuff blows my mind. I, and I worked there for 40 years. Now I look back and I wonder. Zora even went so far as to go to the ZF company and get a four speed quote in March of 55. They were pretty damn expensive. A hundred of them would be 321 bucks a piece. That was a hell of a lot of money. So that's why that didn't fly. This is interesting. Turns out car 3956 was VIN number 50. It was the last Flint built body. Okay. And they couldn't sell it, even to a VIP. So here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to transfer it to styling, and they're going to turn it into a 1956 Corvette. So we still got uh, two V8 test cars going together. We don't know what. Anyway, this is what they turned it into. Didn't have the side molding on the side. This was in the GM styling dome in April. There's the interior, pretty close to being uh, what went to production. A couple minor little changes. 56 chassis, April 1st. Now, if you if you know anything about Zora, and if you read Jerry Burton's book, Zora really stepped on somebody's toes. We don't know who, but he was banished to the GM Proving Grounds by Ed Cole to work on lowly truck and bus brains. It's been talked about everywhere. Zora, up to the day he died, Never took exception to it. Went right along with the story. Jerry Burton didn't know to, okay, what it really was. And then Ed Cole told the entire staff, okay, Zora's going away for a while. He's going to learn a lesson. He's doing penance. While he's gone, I still want you to copy him on everything you're working on. Because someday he might come back. That was unique. That never happened before where Ed Cole would say something like that. Where did he really go? He really went to work for John Dolza to work on the top secret GM fuel injection. This is dated April 5th, 1955. There's the economizer down there, number seven. Engineer by the name of Z, uh, Zetchin is working at it. Look right below his name. Whose name is there? Duntoff and Hafner. Look up at line number three. Whose name is there? Duntoff. He's already been assigned two projects on the fuel injection. He's working directly, secretly, for John Dolza, but no one's supposed to know, because if somebody knew where he went, for real, all of Detroit would know GM was working on a fuel injection. And Zor's drinking from a fire hose. He's literally absorbing two years of development work that went on before he got there. And on April 14th, he writes another top secret letter to Ed Cole, and Zora types it out at home on his own typewriter and he leaves spaces. See, Zora wasn't one just to say, hey, we got this problem, or you got this problem, you fix it. No, Zora would cite the problem and then tell you how to fix it. Every one of those sketches is his invention and his hand sketching. So he wasn't just throwing the bombs over the wall in somebody else's engineering camp. He was providing the solution. And everywhere in that letter, he says, it's conceivable that a straightforward fuel injection can be controlled in his manner. 
However, we're using RAM pipes and the system sensing manifold vacuum only will not do. He says the wave uh, at the closing of the intake valve increases volumetric efficiency of the cylinder. It was Zora's idea to put the RAM pipe concept into fuel injection. He talks about the mass flow sensitive control. He's thinking of something he's already seen on a Holley ignition control introduced in 1949 Forge. So his brain is going overtime. He's got all these great ideas. And he's sending this secret letter. He says the nozzles must be open to atmosphere. Here he draws a picture of how to present it at the intake valve. He's also looking at the coasting shutoff valve. What Zora proposed actually became the 1957, it's on that black car over there, the 4360 fuel injection. It was all his idea in a secret letter he wrote to Ed Cole April 14, 1955. He says, toward the end of my first week here, the first installation was completed. The engine had starting difficulties, uh, up to 3,000 RPM. The lag, there was a lot of lag in response to the throttle. And two tests indicate acceleration fuel is there, but not in the proper timing. That's because what they were working on was a timed fuel injection, just like the Bosch. Literally a mechanical distributor to squirt fuel. Zora's idea was to squirt less fuel all the time and it was a whole lot easier to control. Now, if you don't think Zora was really working there, this is a letter on engineering staff letterhead with his name on it up at the top. Who's above him? John Dolza. He's being included in the distribution list along with the sole employees of Dolza's staff. He's working on Dolza's staff. If you know anything about, if you ever worked in GM or a big company, you know you, you do. This is one thing that is religious. You recognize who works for who and where. And you're very precise in, your cop, in who you copy letters to. Down at number five, what's Mr. Duntoff in charge of? He's in charge of the Mercedes test. John Dole's son told me when I wrote the book, that his dad used to bring home one or two gull wing fuel injected 54 Mercedes that GM bought. And they used to tear ass up and down Woodward all the time. Well, you know, it's, it's nice. I believe it because his son told me. But I never had proof of it. <laughs> Zora's favorite photo. The only copy that exists is in his own personal file. Taken at the proving ground April 18th. So it was a real story. And of course, the letter before that says that's what he's assigned to work on. Now, back to his, uh, so his, his close ratio proposal, it's 184. It didn't work. They burned out two clutches. But Zora's gone. He's being copied on this, but he's not in the engineering circle at Chevrolet anymore. And that's where someone else came up with the 2.2 ratio. Didn't actually come out as that. Came out as a 294 because they couldn't get it in time till 56. But basically, he's not involved in Chevy engineering anymore, but he is getting, getting courtesy copies. When Duntoff sent the secret report to Ed Cole, Ed Cole sent a copy to the man who replaced him at Cadillac as the chief engineer, a guy by the name of C. Fred Arnold. Arnold's engineer working on fuel injection from the Cadillac perspective was Carl Rasmussen. So Ed Cole sent the secret report to Arnold who gave it to Rasmussen. Rasmussen sends it back a week later to Ed Cole and says, there is remarkable agreement between Mr. Duntov's opinions and those we have. Cadillac came on board instantaneously supporting Zora's proposal rather than the one that they were working on for two years prior. The 53 Corvette, uh, the 55 Corvette did come out with a three-speed, came out with a 294 because they couldn't get the hardened gears in for a year at the 2.2. Uh, at this point in time, now May 2nd Cadillac, the Cadillac engine replaces the Buick engine as the prime engine for fuel injection. Buick backed off, Cadillac is now full, bo full bore. They, they want something better than their dual quad engine. So that's where future development's gonna go. Zora is working there full time. He's attending all the staff meetings. He's copied on all the letters. 
just as protocol dictates. Uh, the Buick engine has still had, got some things going on. There's Cadillac. It's going to be in the Eldorado at the very bottom on the left. The Chevrolet Corvette. Chevrolet now has their first Corvette engine over there at Research and Development. It's being broken in for fuel injection. That's May 16th. Meanwhile, Maury Rose takes a V8 three-speed Corvette to the Indy 500, and he's demonstrating it to all the officials and anybody who wants to see burnouts with a three-speed Corvette. Here's Maury with his pipe in hand. Now this is another letter, May 27th. The fuel injection program is getting pretty close to production requirements. And again, Zora is copied on it as a member of the staff, but this is still the air density system. At this point, the thing they've worked on for two years, the air density is the mainstream, that's the timed one, and the system B is now the mass airflow, that's Zora's proposition. And they literally named them A and B based on the A and B in the paragraphs of the letter. Now he writes another secret letter to Ed Cole, and again he writes it on the engineering staff letterhead, and it's specifically about all the things he's working on with the fuel injection, what he's learned on the Mercedes. And he basically came up with this sketch that he attached to it to show how his mass airflow works. And on June 4th, Cadillac gives Zora's system the go. Gives it the green light as their mainstream for their Eldorado in 57. This time, Zora has no trouble leaving. This is his third year now. He has no trouble leaving to go to Le Mans. And he actually wins his class driving a Porsche. I'd say Chevrolet was pretty tolerant at that point, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't... <laughs> but he actually won his class for the first time. However, about two hours into the race, the Mercedes-Benz Factory 300 LSR, driven by Pierre LeVay, who was 49 years old, crashed on lap 35 when he rear-ended an Austin Healey and he was still doing 100, he had only got down from about 180 down to 150 when he hit the back of the Austin, which was like hitting a ramp. It was like Evil Knievel hitting a ramp. And when he hit the back of that car, it flew him over the fence, into the grandstands, and killed 83 people in the stands. John Fitch was his co-driver. He, this was still the first driver's, uh, stint when this happened. So John obviously never got never got in the race. And the car was all magnesium, including the frame. That's all that was left of it in the upper left hand corner. Because of this accident, Mercedes withdrew their other team cars immediately and never raced again for over 30 years. That was the last corporate Mercedes race. So again, Zora turned it into a business trip. He's over there checking out four-speed transmissions. He attends the luncheon at Pomeroy's. He's trying to make connections. And now he writes another private letter to Ed Cole. And he's still talking about his special Corvettes. He says, you know, in conjunction with my proposed talk on the Corvette, I was again turning over my mind the whole Corvette situation. I further propose you entrust me the charge of the Corvette. And he doesn't get it again. He doesn't give up, but he doesn't get it. August 10th, fuel injection meeting. Uh, both Mr. Barr and, uh, and Mr. Duntoff. Now, this is not Harry Barr. This is a guy by the name of Barr. The biggest problem they had was coming off idle. If you've ever driven one or worked on one, that transition from idle to moving the car is the hardest thing to do. So again, Zora takes sketches, proposes all these neat things that he eventually gets a U.S. patent on and eventually goes to production. Another guy was always thinking, always coming up with the next way to, to fix something. So now they're finally ready August 22nd, 55, to build a Cadillac system. Zora, again, has no trouble getting away from the engineering staff 
and he gets in a 56 prototype passenger car and he races up Pikes Peak in a disguised 1956 Chevy with dual quads. There's a picture. I've been up that road in some camouflage 1997 Corvettes we were developing. This was in 95 when I did that trip. And I'm telling you, I was scared to death driving up that road 30 miles an hour, much less racing up that road. There is nothing when you go off that cliff. Now, remember the guy in the 53 Corvette photo? I said his name was George. There's George. George is with Zora. George is out at Pikes Peak. He's a dual quad and fuel injection tune-up expert. I don't know what he was doing at the Corvette plant. <laughs> Unless he was there helping Bill Byer, but I can't ask him anymore. George Escobar. Every, he keeps turning up everywhere that Zora is when he's got to have his engine tuned up. There's a, there he is, fourth from the right. And there he is, checking the oil. There's Zora behind him. They're still having some cold problem issues. Now, October 7th. October 1st, Zora finished his six-month stint at engineering staff and he was welcomed back to Chevrolet October 1st. And you're gonna see all the letterhead and all the name protocol changes because now he's back at Chevrolet. There it is right there. Here is a report on fuel injection from engineering staff. Now Zora is copied as being at Chevrolet. One of the first things he has to work on is the race car kit for the Corvette. And they're gonna make two kits, two race car kits. Two for 56 Corvettes, one for engineering, and one for design check. So there's four laps, but only that's pretty typical. Only two are going to go on cars. Meanwhile, over at Engineering Development, they're doubling the fuel injection test engines. They're going to have two 57 Chevy V8s over there now because Ed Cole wants Chevrolet to piggyback on the heels of the Cadillac. It's basically going to be the same system. Zora is now back at Chevy Engineering. This is the letter that he, that he writes to Max Wrench. He says, Max, I want you to do the telescoping thing with the ram air pipes, and I want you to determine the right length for this engine. That's why he's got that variable little cup there at cylinder two and cylinder seven. That's a Chevy Engineering photo showing what Zora's, Max's approach to doing what Zora's asking for. And he wants it run all the way up through 6,000 RPM if possible. Now. This is when the Duntoff cam comes into existence. Zora Duntoff did not design the Duntoff cam. He never took credit for the Duntoff cam. He only took credit for, it wasn't his idea to name it after him, but they did. The guy who invented the Duntoff cam was Alessandro Abroglio Anzani. That's a mouthful, he was an Italian guy. This is Zora's notes, and they're dated October 20th, 1955. Zora did that at home, too. He typed out the lift and the duration for the Duntoff, for what became the Duntoff cam. He did it because he finally had a reason to use that cam with the fuel injection. He knew it would work. He had it in the back of his mind for 30 years because he raced against Anzani who raced motorcycles and cars in Europe in the 1930s. He saw Anzani's design and he knew it was perfect for what they were doing, but he had no application and he put it in the back of his head and he wrote it down on this piece of paper at home. Anzani was born in Italy in 1877, he died in 1956. He was a bicycle and a motorcycle racer. He built a two-wheel lightweight, and in 1905, he, he uh, set the world speed record for a motorcycle. 1906, he was a world champion. And in 1907, he built a motorcycle with a prop on it. There it is on the bottom and left. And the prop part didn't work. But he did, that's where Zora learned to use aluminum because it was this guy that taught him to use aluminum. And this guy was so wealthy because in 1914, he patented the radial aircraft engine that he invented. And with World War I, he became a multi-millionaire overnight in Europe. And he had factories in England, France, and Italy. <coughs> so in 1920, since he could afford to play all the time he started racing cars, and that's where Duntoff ran into him. And in 1950, he sold out his, his business. 
So then November 1st, 1955, and this has been published before, Zora writes his famous epistle on notes on sports car racing, SCCA and FIA. He talks about production cars, modified cars, and unlimited cars. And he basically gets that to Ed Cole. That's where Ed Cole gets talking about doing some Seedling cars for 56. And amateurs cannot be paid in the SCCA. And he clearly mentions that Briggs Cunningham is a millionaire uh, uh, financer of SCCA racing activities. November 3rd, 55. What happened to the frame from number one, 1953, remember? They saved the frame, they saved the convertible top, and they burned the body. Well, they still hung on to it because this letter, November 3rd, 1956, says, we're gonna reuse 53 number one's frame and 55 numbers one frame, and we're gonna put new hand-laid 56 bodies on them, and Maury Rose is in charge, and we're gonna paint them white, and they're gonna be the first two Seedling Corvettes for 1956. So that's where the frame went. And furthermore, we're gonna rework 5951 per Mr. Duntoff's approval. That's his favorite car. And we're gonna put all the Corvette heavy duty RPOs on it, and we're gonna hold his work order open until he says close it. And that's gonna be his Sebring car. This is the engineering letter that now establishes Cadillac as the number one rollout of fuel injection, Chevrolet's number two, followed by Olds, Pontiac, and lastly Buick. More on car 5951. This is November 28th. They're going to leave Detroit December 5th and go to the proving ground in Phoenix, Arizona. They're going to take a mechanic, a special tester, and a carburetor man. Matter of fact, they're going to take George again. George is one of those three guys. They're going to accompany Duntoff, who is trying to do a mock assault on the Daytona records. He's going to try to hit 155 miles an hour at Phoenix, Arizona, because he knows he's going to have five miles an hour wheel slip in Florida on the sand, so to hit 150, he's got to hit 155 out here. There are another guy's taking a stock car to simulate the 500 mile race at Darlington. Zora's still working on fuel injection, though he's multitasking, so now he's writing another letter to Cole on uh, what to do to make the fuel injection work while he's away setting up the race cars. November 30th, there was a meeting held at the Proving Ground but with Cole, Barr, Sanders, McKenzie, Maury Rose, and Duntoff. Briggs Cunningham attended, as did John Fitch. Zora demonstrated the 5951 on the track. They actually ran it on the track to show them how fast they would go. Cole remarks that we have two ZF4 speeds on order for over six months. We better get get hot, we better get those ZF transmissions in. Cole wants to run two to three Corvettes at Sebring. Fitch thinks the Corvettes can do 135 to 140 on the straights. And Cunningham wants the faster 16 to one steering. And he wants the car to run stripped. So this is where they're putting together the official game plan documented on Chevrolet notes for their attempt. Zora says the 56 chassis changes he's making in the works will fix any handling issues. Maury Rose asked about a high torque, uh, pot, that's an uh, outside concerns, positive traction. And Cunningham, Cunningham thinks they'll have to do two pit stops at four hour intervals in order to complete the 12 hours. Zora starts buying parts from Europe as he gets his hands on. He buys the running lights, the driving lights from Marshall in France. He, then he takes the EX87, he takes that out to Phoenix, December 13th with the wing on the back. And he actually hits 155.2 miles per hour. So he thinks he can do 150 on the sand at Daytona. It's got an engine 17699-8-B stamped on the pad. And he's got 10,210 miles on it as he poses for this picture with the proving ground in the background, and he's got his favorite white Puma shirt on. Why is that important? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. He then takes the car, they repaint it red, and he takes it to Daytona, and he sets the 150 mile, to try to set the 150 mile hour mark with the 
fin on the back, but there's too much drag with the fin on the back, so he takes the fin off. When he takes the fin off, he hits 150.583 the next day, and there's his wife congratulating him after the record run. Oh, you remember card number 50, the last flint body? That's it. It now looks like a 56, and it debuts on the turntable at the Motorama, January 17, 1956. January 21st, this is the letter uh, that actually says they're hiring John Fitch as a consultant for both Daytona and Sebring. It, McKenzie hires him, he's Doles' his nemesis, and uh, is specifically to, to uh, be successful in, uh, in Florida. Okay, so there's 6903 on the left, test car 6903, 6901, which is Zora's favorite, and 6905 with John Fitch in it in January on Daytona Beach. And the two outside cars are actually 1953 frames that we looked at with the hand laid 56 bodies. I still can't tell you which one was number, VIN number two and which is VIN number three. There's Zora with the uh, fin on the car posing. Now Harry Barr never liked high performance camshafts. This is his note to Zora on January 30th and he says, don't you think we should confine our work to the 390 Corvette camshaft and then later consider your cam, which is inferior at idle? Harry, Harry Barr didn't make any bones. He didn't like Duntoff's camshaft. <laughs> so, then, remember, um, they rebuilt car number three, 100%. Well, they, not only did they save the frame, they saved the beat up body and they put it in storage. And here on February 1st, 1956, this gets the body from number three out of storage to put on 55 number 211. And those two cars that were the 53s that were rebodied, uh, I don't know which one this is again, but they, they were sent to Daytona for pro uh, promotional purposes. And here it is going up against the uh, one of the T-Birds. February 2nd, Zora again contacts Cole. He talks about the failure of the 53 Corvette, how the V8 made it better. Talks about his high lift cam, but it really isn't a high lift cam because it's actually less lift than the standard cam. And in short, uh, again, he's lobbying to take over the Corvette program. He talks about the fact that uh, Actually, Zora preferred automatic transmissions over manuals because it let the, let the driver do one less thing and concentrate on steering, accelerating, and braking. Really lobbying all the time. Said the Corvette can be used for rallies as it stands for circuit racing. Some, uh, some additions are necessary. So he does this in February 56. I believe this letter was in regards to the 1956 SCCA convention hosted by Chrysler in Detroit. Zuntoff, Zuntoff thought it should have been hosted by Chevy. They fixed that a year later. So they'll see those, dun those beach cars at Daytona were rebuilt into the three, uh, three of the five cars that were run at 56 Sebring. There's John Fitch's car. He had 6901. That's the one they put the 307 in with the four speed. The lights in front are those exact lights that Zora ordered from Marshall in France. And the other cars that raced there were 6903, 6905, and 6911 was pretending to be a private entry. And they won. Basically, teammate, they did. They were in a class by themselves, but they made a respectable showing. Dick Thompson went on to win the SCCA championship uh, in the fall with his 1956 Corvette. You can just see it off the right-hand side. You can see the stripe on the nose, car number 106. Now, what's he chasing? He's chasing three gull wings. He's not behind the, he's not behind the gull wings. He's trying to pass the gull wings and lap them. He's got a whole lap on him by the end of the race. So he actually wins the race 
and he wins the SCCA championship, and he pretty much establishes the 56 Corvette as a winner. But remember that accident that happened at Le Mans? This is September. This is the meeting of the American Automobile Manufacturers Association in the GM building, 14th floor, the private confines of Harlow Curtis, the president of GM. These are all the, in fact, there's Harlow, second from the back on the left. There's a, there's a chairman of the boards and some famous DuPont executives paintings on the back wall. There's Harlow Curtis on the left, president of GM. To his right is George Romney, president of American Motors. To his right is Henry Ford, CEO of Ford. And to his right is Lester Lum Colbert, president of the Chrysler Corporation. This is the meeting where they agreed that the big four would no longer participate and have factory teams in racing. And this was in September of 56, but they knew they couldn't shut it down immediately, so they agreed to shut it down June 15th. No additional projects would be undertaken after this meeting, and everything underway would be phased out by June 15th. So that's where that came from. Meanwhile, fuel injection is now ready for production in the Corvette. Here's Zora testing the first one with uh, Tom uh, McCahill, the editor of Popular Mechanics. The very first fuel injected production engine was built at Flint on October 1856. Uh, the first auto show held since before World War II was held for the 1957 models on December 6, 1956 in New York City, Manhattan at the new Coliseum on Circle Drive. And it was the 42nd New York Auto Show. The last one they had before that was 1941. People think, well, wait a minute. Why did it take so long after the war to get the auto shows going again? Well, what nobody realized was the U.S. government was rationing steel, copper, aluminum, everything necessary to make a car. They rationed it up through 1955. Every single car manufacturer was told by the U.S. government how many cars they could build every year, well, period. The Korean War and the Korean War was part of that. Well, they were told how many you can build, so if you're already building and selling every one you can make, why would you want to advertise and do an expensive car show to get people even more excited about something you can't sell them? They took off the rationing in 19, er, as, a, as of the first of the year in 56, the end of 55, so that's when they planned for a new car show. And that's where they debuted the Corvette in the center, the show car, to announce GM was, was selling fuel injection. The first company to sell fuel injection and hit one horsepower per cubic inch. And that's what the first auto show looked like since World War II. Meantime, the factory had built four fuel-injected test cars. They had shipped them over to Nassau, Bahamas, and they were in the first uh, five pole positions along with the SR2, which is equipped with fuel injection, for their first race, and they were a miserable failure. They weren't any faster than the 56s, and they didn't handle as good as the 56s. So fuel injection didn't make any difference at this point. And the SCCA, held their national convention in a brand new styling dome in Warren, January 20th and 21st, 1957. And again, they rolled out that show car to show everybody. It was pretty important because there's Briggs Cunningham on the right. There's James Kimberly of Kimberly uh, Clark Bathroom Products. They were both independently wealthy. They both didn't have to work and they both raced Ferraris and Jaguars in the SCCA, and there's Harry Barr <laughs> showing them the, uh, the Corvette fuel-injected show car. There's Zora showing off a all-white with a beige-white interior fuel-injected Corvette. There's a model sitting in the Corvette. That car was specifically built and given to Dick Thompson, who was racing fuel-injected Corvettes in 57, this was the car they gave him to drive on the weekends from his dentist's office to the racetrack to pick up his race car and go racing with it and then drive home in this one. 
They also showed the first Black Widow prototype to tell people that we're doing sedan racing. Stay tuned, the fuel injection Black, Black Widows are coming. That leads us up to the entire culmination of everything they've done, really making a grandstand at Sebring in 1957. The mule car was there. The brand new all magnesium Corvette S was there. The old practice cars were there, P3, P9. And then the new fuel injected car showed up to run alongside the blue one. And at the end of 57, Thompson and the number four fuel injected Corvette finished first in class. The number three Corvette finished second in class. The Magnesium Corvette SS only ran 26 laps. And the reason for the failure was after 26 laps was quite basic. When they were building that car at a cost of over $2 million, they went down to the local Napa parts store literally to look through their drawers of rubber suspension bushings since they were designing it from scratch and they bought stock Plymouth rubber suspension bushings. And that's what they put in the mule. And when they ran the mule in December, January, and February on the test track in Michigan, it performed flawlessly. And when it went to Florida with the hot weather, you know what happens to rubber in warm weather? It starts to get softer. <laughs> the bushings crept out after 26 laps. A $3 bushing bought from a store took that car out of the race. Anyway, that means success. Everything from the Corvette from day one up to this point in time has been successful. Now, finally, that's how Zora got involved. That's what really happened with the Corvette, and that's the end of this presentation.